Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is the daily chart of gold in the Japanese yen provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. Now this is a very important chart because we're seeing a breakout to new highs in the price of gold denominated in Japanese yen. As you know, the government of Japan with the election of Abe has uh, gone on a money printing uh, course now. You can see that in the price of the yen, which has really just collapsed against the dollar. You can see this move that I've pointed out many times is the drop to the Fukushima low and rise with central bank intervention, admitted central bank intervention. And you can see that the size of the rise that we currently have is almost twice the size. So this is a massive, massive move in the Japanese yen. And uh, you can see it ran all the way from about 76 something to 89 something. So that's a massive move in that currency. And uh, it appears that uh, they've got the Japanese now uh, doing the beggar thy neighbor uh, money printing game. Uh, the other move that's important is the move that we've seen in the euro. Now that's the euro and the yen are going to be the two major currencies in the dollar basket and so that's going to have a big impact on the dollar. Uh, so if we ever get the two of those uh, moving the same direction at the same time then there could be a serious problem for the dollar so far what has happened is the as the yen uh, has weakened uh, then the euro has strengthened but uh, if we ever get uh, both the yen strengthening and the euro strengthening uh, then we'll probably get a big drop in the dollar index and let's go over to the questions of the night the first one is from dragonfly doji and this is Precious Metals Purchasing Act. Hey, Brother John, hope all is well. Man, I've been hearing a lot about this Precious Metals Purchasing Act lately. Can you please cover this? Is it just for Illinois? Also heard some things on Patriot News Radio today that there may be some executive orders demanding registration of newly purchased as well as your own stack at home nationwide. Any clarification would be great. Scary stuff, Dee Dee. Uh, well, I did a little bit of research on this, and I went ahead and pulled up the act itself here. This is at ILGA.gov legislation, and uh, this is from uh, actually introduced in February of 2012 by Senator Kirk Dillard. He's a Republican. I'll read the synopsis and then go into some of the details. Uh, this new act creates the Precious Metals Purchasing Act, provides that a person who is in the business of purchasing precious metal shall obtain a proof of ownership, create a record of the sale, and verify the identity of the seller, provides that a person who is in the business of purchasing precious metals shall not pay for the precious metal in cash, and shall record the method of payment, requires the purchaser to keep a record of the sale, for one year or if the purchase amount is over $500 for five years provides that a person who violates the act is guilty of a petty offense subject to a fine not exceeding $500 provides that the Attorney General may inspect records investigate an allegation alleged violation take action to collect civil penalties so that's the act uh, there's a lot of holes in this act and let's go down and look at it um, the first thing that I would say is about the proof of ownership. You can see here subsection A, uh, section 10, a person who is in the business of purchasing precious metal before purchasing an item containing precious metal from the same person exceeding $250 in value regardless of form or quantity shall one obtain from that person a proof of ownership for the precious metal and a record that contains the name, address, and telephone number of the person or persons authorized. Now, 
I don't know too many people who have proof of ownership of precious metal. Uh, precious metal generally tends to be kind of cash and carry. So I think this is going to be a really big problem for them. I don't see how they're really ever going to generate that information. If you think about the junk silver and uh, gold eagles and things like that, do people really have proof of ownership for things that are given as gifts? Uh, that people give silver dollars or half ounce, quarter ounce gold eagles as gifts. Do, do people really have a record of these things? It just seems really problematic. I don't see how they can possibly make that enforceable. And uh, if if they try to do that, then it's clear that what they will do, especially with, you can see the penalty here is about $500. They're just going to end up driving people to a black market. Now, as to whether or not uh, there's any penalty or tracking of exchanging metal for metal. For example, if you swap silver for gold or gold for silver, uh, and I think there's a lot of people who are planning on doing that, silver stackers planning on doing that, uh, I don't know if this would cover that or not. So a pretty weak effort, and it's by one state legislature. We know that a lot of the other state legislatures are going in the exact opposite direction. And of course, this is the state of Illinois, so this is one of the most bankrupt states and uh, just a terrible uh, politics and everything, uh, just heading downhill really fast, probably only second behind California in uh, the destruction that liberals and leftists are reeking on that state. I don't think that uh, this type of bill has much of a future. I don't think it's even going to make it to a vote, but we'll have to see. And next question. This is from Corins. What are your thoughts on this controversial article? Uh, and this is about, is the Fed really monetizing the debt? It's from Pragmatic Capitalism. And... Uh, he basically says that uh, the Fed isn't really monetizing the debt. And uh, actually, when you get down to the meat of why he says that, he links to another article. He keeps repeating, no one understands the modern monetary system. Uh, so but let's go to the article that he links to try to explain why uh, the Fed isn't monetizing the debt. This is his explanation of how the purchase of the debt is done. It's important to understand that the Federal Reserve and private banks can always be relied on to provide financing for the Treasury with the mechanics working via borrowing operations. Yes, the existing U.S. monetary system is one where banks can be harnessed as agents for the federal government, but make no mistake, although these banks can be harnessed as agents of the government at times, as in the role of market maker for treasury bond auctions, they are indeed private, for-profit seeking entities serving private shareholders. These interests are not always in line with that of the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, Congress, or public purpose. There are a number of legal obligations on the primary dealers, a select group of private banks, not the least of which is to offer bids at treasury bond auctions. So the U.S. Treasury will always find a buyer for its bonds. And if there is a weak demand from private banks, non-bank private agents or foreign agents for T-bonds, the central bank can always buy them in the open market. Now that seems to go against what he had just argued. The U.S. Fed is a bank and has a potentially unlimited capacity to buy T-bonds or any other asset in the economy with ex nihilo money creation. So it is misguided to worry too much, if at all, about the U.S. Treasury ever going bankrupt on its fiat dollar denominated debts. It never need do so. And if it were, there would be due to political wrangling. Usually the U.S. Congress postures on whether or not to raise the debt ceiling of the federal government and then acts sensibly. So, uh, and then he says, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve can never run out of money 
Under current laws, the U.S. federal government could run out of money if and only if the debt limit is not raised, barring extreme politics, blah, 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 blah. So uh, I don't think anybody was talking about them running out of money. What they were talking about was how much of the deficit is being covered by the Fed. So let's look at this group here. What he's saying is that the primary dealers are actually the ones that are purchasing these T-bonds. And of course, the question is going to be, where are these primary dealers getting their money? So you can see this is the from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. This is the primary dealer list. This is the current list. And you have, I've covered this before, Bank of Nova Scotia, BMO Capital, BNP Paribas, Barclays, Cantor Fitzgerald, Citigroup, Credit Suisse, Daiwa, Deutsche Bank, Goldman, HSBC, Jefferies, JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, Mizuho, Morgan Stanley, Nomura, RBC, RBS, SG, and UBS. Those are the primary dealers that we currently have. Now, if you go to additions and removals, I've covered this before, you can see here we have some interesting removals here. Countrywide was removed from the list as a result of their acquisition by Bank of America. Lehman Brothers was deleted from the list. Bear Stearns was deleted from the list. Merrill Lynch was deleted from the list. And of course, the last we have here, MF Global was deleted, uh, it was added in February of 2011, and then it was deleted from the list back in October of 2011. So that's the last change we have to the primary dealers list. So yes, primary dealers can go bankrupt, but of course we know the Fed manages those and they, they fold them into these others here. So these are the big boys, but the question is going to be, of course, where are they getting their money? We know that they're not getting tax money. So uh, somehow the banks are coming up with the money to buy these bonds as primary dealers. Of course, that has to do with uh, various relationships they have with the Federal Reserve and their capital requirements, their reserve requirements. And so uh, it's all one big incestuous uh, situation with these banks and the Federal Reserve. So I don't think there's much behind that criticism. Uh, it's technically true that uh, there's no way they, they they don't have to run out of money, but I don't think anybody's arguing that. What they are arguing is what's shown in this chart here. This is a chart, and this is from mybudget360.com. This is a chart of federal government current expenditures and federal government current receipts. So you can see the lower red line here is the receipts. Now I'd said that they had uh, flatlined at 2.2 trillion. It looks like they're actually more at about 2.5, 2.6 trillion. Uh, the receipts have kind of reached a ceiling there. Whereas you can see the expenditures, uh, they went up rapidly during the financial crisis. And uh, what's so very interesting is uh, it was told to us that it was going to be temporary boost in spending and then it would come back down once the crisis was over well we can see it never came back down now we have the democrats talking about uh, raising taxes again we don't hear anything about spending cuts and as i've said many many times before you will never see any spending cuts uh, you will hear talk about potential spending cuts and you'll see token spending cuts which don't really mean anything but as far as real substantial spending cuts you'll never see those because they don't in intend to cut a thing they never have so here's the big difference here. The difference is the deficit. Uh, you've got about 2.6 trillion in revenues. You've got about 3.8 or so trillion in expenditures. So you got about 1 trillion, 1.2 trillion dollars every year of debt that uh, has to be covered. Now, as to the argument of, well, is it the Fed buying it or is it the primary dealers buying it? It doesn't really matter in the long run. The long run is going to be inflation, uh, just like the type of inflation that we're seeing here in uh, the price of gold in Japanese yen. So as the government of Japan is printing money to, and they're, they're in my opinion, coming close to end game, 
Um, I'm not sure who's going to reach Endgame first, whether it's the U.S. or Japan, but uh, it's going to be a close race. They're definitely uh, going down the road of uh, blowout type of printing money now, and you can see it's reflected here in the gold price. So let's get over to the silver chart. Uh, we're slowly coming back. Uh, I had predicted that there would be a snapback rally uh, at the beginning of the year just based on prior years that they tend to push the price down a lot during late December, especially to try to suppress the year-end performance of silver, which uh, had, had done very well and would have done very well for the year if it wouldn't have been for this uh, smackdown that we had right here right before the end of the year. But uh, as soon as the year was over, we did get this snap back. And of course, then that was, uh, that was crushed by the news, which was very bizarre news, that the Federal Reserve had leaked some minutes that uh, indicated that uh, they weren't going to buy as many T-bonds as they had been buying. And of course, that's all been backed away from now. It was just kind of like a convenient reason to slam down the metals which they did but I expect them to rally you can see we're at about thirty dollars and eighty cents here if we draw in the lines we can see that uh, we got a decent breakout of this downtrend line and uh, we're consolidating in this kind of rising pennant so it may be that a bottom has been put in here a lot of people were looking for silver to go down and test that 26 again. I know some people had said that uh, it was going to test 26 and it was going to ultimately break through. Go all the way down to that 22 mark. And uh, a lot of people were going to get a chance to stack some really cheap silver. Uh, I didn't cover the question tonight about Perth Mint and some of the tightness. I haven't had a chance to research it myself. I am seeing kind of anecdotal signs that uh, the physical silver supply is tightening up. But again, uh, you can never use the word shortage because if you say there's a shortage, then someone's going to find one website with one type of silver somewhere. And uh, if it's still available, uh, then they're going to say that uh, you're crazy. But we know that these shortages, they kind of come in a rolling form and they go through different issues. Uh, the, the issues from the Perth Mint, I believe, are starting to get fairly tight, and as well as some other issues, some have reported some issues with the Canadian Mint. The other thing that's been reported is that some of the premiums now are starting to fail to follow the price down. If the price does decline, some of the online dealers are just keeping their uh, premiums, uh, letting their premiums expand and keeping the price the same. So all of, those, all of those are things that you will tend to see if a disconnect is building between the physical and the paper. Ultimately, I think there will be a disconnect between the physical and the paper, and then uh, we'll have to see how those premiums do and what, how the online dealers respond, uh, whether they just try to build up premiums, they just outright raise the price, or what they do to respond to it because they're going to have to do something to stay in business and that they're not in business of taking a loss. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that and uh, also on their hedging activities because that's very important. As I pointed out before, the MF Global scandal was very significant in that it was a threat to the ability of the physical silver sellers to hedge their inventory. And if they're unable to hedge their inventory, then ultimately they're just not going to sell until the price rises again, and that would be uh, that would do a lot of damage to the physical solar market. And we'll talk to you next time.